That was President Biden calling President Putin a war criminal for the first time yesterday as Russian forces continue shelling civilian buildings throughout Ukraine. The Kremlin called the president's remarks, quote, inadmissible. But now Ukrainian officials are asking U.S. allies to follow the president's lead. In virtual remarks to the EU parliament this morning, the Ukrainian defense minister asked EU lawmakers to declare Putin a war criminal, too. It's a topic Secretary Blinken is likely to touch on when he gives remarks in just a few minutes from now. And here on set with me for more on the Allied response to Russian aggression is the EU Ambassador to the United States, Savros Lambrinidis. Uh, Ambassador, it is good to see you. Let me start with the issue of formally declaring Putin a war criminal, uh, the process in the EU for doing that. Explain it. Well, there's no process in the EU. There's an international process at the International Criminal Court. Correct. Which is, the, which is the body that decides those issues, and they have already launched an investigation, because indeed, to be very clear, under international law, the so-called Geneva Conventions, uh, even when you are at war, you have rules that you have to follow. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of those rules is that you cannot intentionally target civilians in the way that Putin has. Mm -hmm. So the ICC is looking into this, and it should. Uh, Putin will have to deal with that accountability as well, when his bloody violence ends. But is it, more, is it important um, of a show of force to have both the United States and the EU formally saying, we think he's a war criminal? Well, we think, we, we, we think look, when you're bombing theaters and schools, you're violating international criminal law, obviously you are potentially committing major war crimes. Right. So this is, uh, to me, the semantics is not important. What is important in this particular case is that he's doing everything possible to attack civilians, hoping to break the spirit of the Ukrainian people. And the reason this is a major crime is because even under war, yes, there are things you could, in theory, do. Yeah. You could go kill mothers and children, hoping that at some point a, another government will say, look, I cannot tolerate any more of these deaths. I will give up. And international law says, well, because that danger of that violence is there. You can't do it. So Putin is committing crimes. He is, as we speak, invading a country violating international law that he simply doesn't want on the map. He's doing it in a premeditated fashion. And he's also trying to do something else, not just kill the Ukrainians literally on the ground, but also kill the international peace order that exists after the Second World War that ensures that might is not right. And if he succeeds in that, yeah. think of all the bullies around the world that will try to do the same. So I'm going to ask you a similar question I asked our U.S. senator that was on the show a little bit earlier. Do we have to prepare ourselves? As you're prepared for, you know, for some sort of peace deal that, would keep, that keeps Putin in power himself and that we suddenly have to work with him again? Or is there a point, has he passed the point of no return in your mind? Well, as Senator mentioned, I, I, I'm not prepared to speculate on this, but I will tell you this. He is cornered and he is dangerous. He's not getting what he wanted. He was expected to... Won't be... he be dangerous as, for as long as he leads that country? Well, we'll have to wait and see about that. You know, I found it very interesting that that um, very strange speech he gave yesterday uh, about uh, some people in Russia needed to be spit out like flies from Russian mouths mm. uh, that uh, oligarchs, uh, referring to oligarchs and others, that needed, the country needed to be cleansed. Which oh, means he's hearing something. He doesn't like what he's hearing. From he's hearing people. something. And you, know, yeah. and, and, you, and you know what? We made sure in the European Union, uh, with the massive sanctions we imposed on him, uh, in, of course, very close coordination with the U.S. administration, we made sure that those oligarchs would be at the, uh, would be at the top of the list. Because... Honestly, people are trying to analyze psychologically Putin. I, you know, I, I, I'm not an expert on, on, on psychology. I don't particularly care to do this. What I care to do is to be able to be prepared for any eventuality of whatever may pop in his uh, mind. At this stage, there are people around him, however, who may not be at the same black space that he is, the cornered space that he may feel in. Right. And those people may have power. And are there people? I, it was just interesting because that's the real question. You know, I've heard reports indicating that, you know, there's only about maybe two or three people that are fully knew the plans and knew who he is and all this stuff. Do you think there are people that can get to him? Well, we'll see. I mean, apparently some are getting to him. He's hearing things he doesn't want to hear, which is why he made that speech. That's true. Uh, right? So, yeah. um, but it, it, look, let's have no delusions about this. That's not a democracy. I mean, Putin came in and he is 
uh, cracking down his own people for years on his civil society of just independent, peaceful people that in any democracy, even semi-democracy, are allowed to exist. He's cracking down. That's not a democracy. He's also tremendously isolated, obviously. Yeah. So is he getting the right information? I doubt it. I've, I've, I've seen other situations like that. Uh, can we therefore trust that his decision-making will be rational? I doubt it. Uh, but what I do know is that we have appended his plans. What I do know is that his economy is crashing, not just now, but in the medium term, when he has to change it. And what I do know is that these things are having massive effects on the Russian people, who are not certainly uh, our enemy. Uh, they are becoming his enemy. Right. Putin is putting them in the, in the target. I want to ask uh, I, I, President Zelensky, he's been doing this, speaking to essentially Western legislatures, and, and today was Germany. And he had some tough words for the Germans. Take a listen. How is it possible when we to told you that uh, the, the Russians were preparing weapons and troops, and we knew that uh, we were preparing, that they were preparing for war, but all you cared was the, the economy. So where is your leadership? Where is your force? Why is the country uh, beyond the Atlantic closer to us than you? Look, he has been an effective spokesperson and I think wanted everybody to, you know, feel a little uncomfortable in the Western alliance as we're watching this and because and, he's looking for more help. I wonder if his remarks are going to trigger a new posture from the EU. Are we going to expect an EU that maybe needs to have a defense system, a, a strong military, a strong... Are we going to... Or, or, is, or do you want more fusing with NATO? What, what is going to be... What is going to be the EU's reaction to what, what has happened? OK, so what has been the reaction already and what will be? Yeah. The action already has been that for the first time in our history we have financed uh, half a billion, and it's going to be more now, mm -hmm. of lethal weapons to go to a country in conflict. Uh, the European Union has, and our member states are sending this massively. Among the first member states to do so is Germany. So the Stingers, all that stuff, are coming from Germany. And they had not done that ever. Into, even into whether Ukraine. NATO no, or and, you, and you understand with Germany's right. history after the Second World War why that makes sense. But There's a lot of is, other countries that didn't want them to have weapons. That, that, that too. Yeah. But this is existential. Uh, Germany has also announced a massive increase of its defense budget this year alone. Uh, and Germany is also contributing massively to the troops, NATO troops, that are going now... Uh, to support the eastern flank of NATO, given uh, Putin's aggression. This, however, is not the beginning of our realization as Europeans that we need to do much more in defense. Mm -hmm. We have been trying for years now, and we are investing much more together to create military capabilities. A few years back, when we said we'd do this, there were some voices here in the States as well who said, why, why do you want to do you that? You already have NATO, right? Yeah, you only have NATO. The answer is... You know what? I don't have a, um, you know, a French army and then a French NATO army or a Greek army and then a Greek NATO army. It is one army. And if that army becomes stronger, more efficient yeah. and more lethal, that means that NATO is stronger, more efficient, and it can prevent people like Putin because it will be perceived as more lethal. By the way, we have an army and we have NATO. We don't have two separate forces Exactly, either. exactly. Well Ambassador, really appreciate you coming in. It was a great, great to be here with you. Thanks very much.